Hi, I'm Casey and I still don't know what I'm doing. Today, I guess we're going to talk about my March and April wrap up. Uh, today is the 1st of May, so I have fresh hot reads that I can discuss and some older reads that we're going to try really hard to remember all our feelings on. Typically, I think I've done this in the order of how I read them, starting from the first of the month to the last of the month. Today, we're going to go by star rating, um, which ideally should mean the worst books first and then the best books at the end. And for the most part, that is going to be the case. But we are going to start with a book I DNF'd and a book I did not rate. And uh, you'll see why very shortly I didn't rate it. Um, but the one I didn't rate should have been much higher in the stack if we were going just by enjoyment factor. But that's not how we're doing it. So the book I did not rate this month was Animorphs number 14, The Unknown. I don't typically rate Animorphs books um, because they are kids books from the 90s. Um, I've only ever rated one of them, I think. And that's just because Cassie gets, you know, a f lot of shit that she doesn't fucking deserve because she's an amazing character and she's my favorite character. And I don't care that people hate her and think that she's <laughs> she's a bit of a stick in the mud. I think she's the, she's the moral compass of the Animorphs, goddammit. Um, but yeah, so I read this one. I enjoyed it. Um, it's a lot of fun to revisit this series, and I think that's all I have to say about this one. By the way, the stack is going to get a little obnoxious because it's over the course of two months, and we have like some shorter books in here, and I'm even missing two books, so it could be more obnoxious. Okay. So, we're on to technically my DNFs, but one of my DNFs I gave one star, but we're going to talk about the one I didn't rate, and that is... A Generation of Sociopaths, How the Baby Boomers Betrayed America by Bruce Cannon Gibney. Um, I DNF'd this around the one-third mark. I think it was around the 30% mark. Um, we were reading this for book club, and quite frankly, I just couldn't stomach it anymore. It reads a lot like an op-ed that got a book deal. It's, it's so frustrating. It's, I really wanted it to kind of take the baby boomers to task for a lot of bad decisions, but it really was truly trying to make a case that an entire generation of people in this country, the United States, are genuine sociopaths. And honestly, that terminology is very outdated and, you know, downright harmful and continues to contribute to the stigma surrounding mental health and mental illness. <laughs> Just, it was very frustrating. It wasn't well written. It was one of the things to piggyback off of what I just said is that I feel like a lot of times in um, nonfiction, you sort of get, you know, grabby title and then a, um, a subtitle or a tagline that tells you what the book is really going to be about. I think you see this a lot with Mary Roach. Um, she has one book called Stiff, The Curious Life of Human Cadavers. It's absolutely fascinating. I recommend that one. But there are a lot of nonfictions, I think, that follow that same sort of strategy, you know? You want something really grabby to pull a reader in, and but you do need to tell them, you need to say what the book is actually about. And unfortunately, this was just far too literal, and I think it made it a worse book. And it, there was just a lot of really outlandish statement followed up by data that didn't really correlate to it but that the author really wanted you to correlate to what they were saying to to make them sound better um so i dnf this because i fucking hate it and it, i was on track for my third one start of the year and with that we're gonna get into the next book this fucker i have left the bookmark in here so you can see how far i got in i believe this is 85 percent of the way i almost made it through the happy years um, but I could tell where it was ending and what it was going to do, and I wasn't having it. <laughs> um, I have a really long, almost rant review of this on Goodreads. Um, I gave this, I gave this one star. I <laughs> was so upset by the time I called it quits. I think it's really, really damaging. I, <sighs> there are so many things I could say about this. Um, and I just, I don't quite know where to start for talking about it here. So this is where we're going to start. We have to do our due diligence here. And I need to start by talking about the optics of an able-bodied author writing about a disabled character and continuing to write in a way that they can never be fixed and that they are so broken that they can never recover. It's bad. 
it's bad, right? It's, that's the kind of story that is really offensive coming from an able-bodied author. And especially whenever you consider the fact that she has openly admitted that she did no research into disability or into the mental health and the ways that disability can affect the, can affect people with mental health issues. And it's really bad. It's really bad. Um, also, I don't think that this author treated her gay characters very well or even her bi or hetero flexible characters, if we want to call them that. Um, and as far as I have been able to tell, and it's a point other people have raised, and they have raised with far more eloquence and grace and with a lot more authority than I can. Um, this was a, um, a cis heteronormative author, I believe, writing about the struggles of, uh, of gay men and bi men. And it just, I don't know that it was very well done, especially because it felt like those characters were often just made to suffer for the sake of suffering. With that being said, that is the point of this book, in my opinion. I could find no other point except the misery, except the pain. And at some point, it became, I felt like I became so desensitized to the constant horror that there would be some new revelation in, um, in, you know, Jude or Willem or Malcolm or JB's life, primarily Willem and J, or not JB, Willem and Jude. Um, and it would just, I would feel like, wow, if this had happened 50 pages ago, I might have audibly gasped. But now I'm just rolling my eyes because it feels cartoonish. And with the subject matter that's in here, which by the way, trigger warnings down below. Um, and I'll get into, I'll get into the whole thing about trigger warnings here in just a moment. But with the subject matter in this book, I didn't think that was good. I, that, that's, that's such an inelegant way to put it. But it, it's, I don't know that as a reader, I should have been desensitized to the pain and suffering that any of the characters felt, especially Jude, especially with the way that we, that the author just was punching and punching and punching and punching and punching Jude constantly. I, you can tell I'm still really heated when I think about this. Um, I don't shy away from difficult books. I often purposely seek out books that are difficult in nature that can talk about a lot of traumas that are really, really, you know, just delicate but I look for something that's handled with some nuance and with some grace and with that sense of delicacy and with a bit of care for what people do suffer through in real life. And I don't think any of that was in here. There was no point to any of the pain and the hurt and the constant, constant battering of Jude except to be misery porn. That's all that felt like this was. And at 85%, I had had enough. I was mad. I was angry. I'm still mad. And I'm still angry when I think about this. And it's why I gave it one star. Uh, the other thing I do want to take note of here um, is that I filmed uh, an April TBR that never went up because I was struggling with TBRs. Um, but in it, I talked about um, one, like, as a person who does engage with, you know, the whole, with the, the book, with a bit of book culture and the whole cultural zeitgeist surrounding a lot of books, I did feel a specific draw to this one because of the cult-like status around it. And I don't want to give this too much more time because I don't understand why it's there unless you're just looking to hurt. I don't, like... <sighs> That there's a lot of this that is very well written. I do feel like in the beginning the author crafted some beautiful characters and as much as there was pain and there was hurt and there was misery and trauma, there was also something to counterbalance it. There was a bit of hope. There was a bit of, you know, lightness and just some, some fresh air in there to air it out a bit. But by the time we got to 85%, it was nothing but just pure misery. And again, I recognize that that was the author's intent. I've read several interviews with this author where she talked about wanting it to be like an ombre cloth where it starts out white and then fades to gray and then goes to black. 
And so I recognize that that's the intent, but I don't know that the intention really outweighs. No, I'm not going to say it that way. I don't know that that intention is good. I don't know that that intention brings anything to the table. And I don't understand why people continue to feed into the feelings surrounding this book. Um, I'm going to say a lot of things inelegantly in here. Um, I can link my Goodreads down below and you can read my much more thought out and cohesive Goodreads review. Okay, I promise to talk about trigger warnings. We're going to talk about it. Um, this author has specifically said that they don't want trigger warnings on this book. They don't think they should be there and that people should, this is paraphrasing a bit, um, push through to read what scares them or what could harm them to further better themselves. Something along those lines. Um, so I'm going to put trigger warnings down below because I recognize that people, there are a lot of people who need them for their own mental stability and their own mental health. And if you're interested in reading this book, but you need trigger warnings, they'll be down below. There are other places on the internet as well that have them. Um, I think that's a harming mentality. <laughs> um, I think it's dangerous. I think that it is not up to the author to tell the reader what they need and um, what is best for them. And I think it is a little, I, it just feels like the bare minimum to prepare readers in some aspect. They don't have to be in here in the book, it, like in the physical form, but I think trying to discourage people from putting trigger warnings around it is very dangerous. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to stop talking about this because it's making me angry. It's making me cranky. This was one fucking star and I'm removing my bookmark so I can use it for something better. Thank you. Okay, so I had one two star um, during March and April, and that was Ring by Koji Suzuki. Um, overall, this was just a very disappointing book. I primarily picked this up because I've wanted to read this um, for a very long time. Uh, the Ring, the US version, the film, was one of the most <laughs> impactful horror movies on me as a preteen. And whenever I found out that it was based on a book, I immediately wanted to pick up the book, but it's taken me a very long time to eventually get around to that. And I picked this up because in March, the, um, uh, because in March, Dead by Daylight released a Ringo chapter. And I was like, you know, what better time to actually start reading this than to pair with that. And unfortunately, this just didn't really deliver for me. There are only about two really kind of creepy and frightening scenes in here that actually, you know, kind of made, like, like got my heart racing a little bit, made me feel a little anxious. Um, and the rest of it is just so unfortunate. There's a lot of things in here that I could probably talk about um, and how disappointing it was. But uh, one of the major things that still sticks with me, you know, several weeks later is the way that Sadako was handled and the way that there's, um, there's a, there's, before I talk about this fully, this is like, I don't know that this is a spoiler, but this is, this could be a minor spoiler. So, um, whenever you don't see the, the words on the screen anymore, um, that's when this portion will be over. But the, there's, there's such a grievous mishandling of Sadako being intersex in here. And I truly feel that it is, only included to further villainize and otherize her. And that's really disappointing. Um, even though I know that this was written, what was it like? I want to say this was published in 93. I don't have it here. It says 2004, but I'm not sure that's entirely right. I'd have to look it up. Um, but I do know that this was written in the 90s. You can tell it's written in the 90s. And I think it's never more clear than whenever it talks about Sadako being intersex. And it's handled in such a grievously nasty, ugly way. And it, it's really unfortunate. It was really difficult to read. Um, but there are a lot of things in here that just didn't quite live up to what I had hoped for this book. And so unfortunately, it just got left a two star. So moving on to books that I did enjoy, which is the vast majority of them. Thank fucking God. Um, but we're going to start with The Gunslinger by Stephen King. This is the, um, I want to say the 83 edition 82 the 1982 edition um and this is three stars 
this was this was a reread for me. Um, I the Dark Tower series is my favorite series of all time, but this is my least favorite book in the entire series. Um, I don't think it reads quite right. It's very different than the rest of the books. Um, I'll link to the video I did comparing this. Ah, I almost dropped it. Hit my face. I'll link to the video I did uh, reading this and the updated version, which by the way I didn't know about until recently. Um, because there are a lot of differences in it and this original version is like kind of a begrudging three stars for me. Um, I've DNF'd it more times than I can count, but I fully read it this time and I've fully read it several other times, but I just, I don't find it very interesting or engaging or very, it, it's just so different than the rest of it. I think Roland's such a weak character in all of it. Um, and it's very disappointing because he's so strong throughout the rest of the series. Um, and this has only ever been a three star because it's like a begrudging three star of like, yeah, you're the beginning of my favorite series and everyone else likes you. And so I might as well say that you're three stars, even though you're kind of like a one star or a constant DNF for me. Um, but this is three stars. The next book I have, which by the way, the rest of these I've organized in like level of enjoyment. So it might not make sense because we were coming up on like lots of three and four stars. <laughs> you might be confused about why I didn't just group two books together, specifically the Gunslinger books. And it's because I've organized these as enjoyed in their, um, in their star rating. So um, the next three star I have is A Gathering of Shadows by V.E. Schwab. This is the second book in the, I believe it's called the Shades of Magic series. And unfortunately, this was a rather disappointing follow up to A Darker Shade of Magic. Um, I don't know what kind of sorcery or magic that that first book had that made me so compelled and so enjoyed, but so much of this follow-up was so goddamn boring. It just, unfortunately, I'm saying unfortunately a lot, fuck it, fine, we're just gonna go full force. I just, I found this really dull. I found this really dull up until, I wanna say the last 150 pages. Last 150 pages were really good. They were very interesting, very compelling. But there are a lot of things in this book that I didn't really particularly enjoy and I thought made it a much weaker story and a much, and just a weak follow-up to what I thought was a really engaging first book. Um, again, mild spoiler here, I hate Kel and Lila being romantically in involved. I do not think it works very well. I think it weakens their bond together and their relationship together. and quite frankly, I felt like it was kind of ham-fisted in here through a lot of it, and I did not really enjoy it. And there were lots of, like, like anytime there were, like, those romantic thoughts or when they they finally get around to seeing each other again, they've got these feelings. I just, I found myself almost rolling my eyes at it. I was like, can we just move on past this? But I will be continuing with the series, and so maybe soon you'll see a conjuring of light in one of these videos. And then my last three star book is really more of like a three and a half, but it is The Annual Migration of Clouds by Premi Mohammed. Um, this one was really fun. I really enjoyed it quite a lot. I, and honestly, I just love this cover. This cover is beautiful with the magpie and the green, the greeny, tealy, bluey veins. It's just so beautiful. I initially gave this book four stars on Goodreads, um, but after about three days, I completely forgot everything that was in here, plot, character, almost all of it. And so I dropped it down to three. So it's much more of like a three and a half. It was really solid. I really enjoyed it. It was very quick. It's very short. And I think that it was really fun. The one thing I do remember in here is the CAD is absolutely horrific and terrifying. And I do think that it did such a good job of getting its um, message across because I remember thinking a lot about the, um, about the themes in here of like ecological devastation and human resi resilience. And like, even though I can remember a lot of the themes and a lot of what it had to say, I don't remember of the, a lot of the actual internals of it. And so that's why it's at a three and a half. Next three and a half star is The Gunslinger. It's the updated version. I believe this was the 2004 version, 2003, one of those. 19 years later it was published. Um, I enjoyed this one a lot more. This one was far more, not necessarily engaging or interesting because it's still the same story, but it was so much better written. It, there was a lot less of that, like, one of my biggest complaints in the original version is it's so sexual in places and in the writing, it's so weird. I, I don't know that I would necessarily describe, you know, sand, like sand grains in a desert as like sensuous or 
seductive or anything like that. There was a lot less of that in, in the updated version. And a lot of the stuff that was included in here, which is just very minimal amounts, really did help improve the story a lot and I thought gave it a lot more balance and I just thought it was a much better book. So this one's much closer to three and a half stars and I think unfortunately the, the reason it's not higher is because it is still the same book that I have read and attempted to read and DNF'd uh, multiple times that I just don't enjoy and so it's unfortunately just my own baggage I think that keeps it from, be from reaching higher on the scale. Let's talk about the four stars. I have another reread here, and that is Abaddon's Gate by James S.A. Corey. This is book three in the Expanse series. Um, this is one of the weaker books in the series, as far as I've read. Um, and unfortunately, I think it just has a lot to do with there's not enough balance. I feel like I'm talking about balance a lot in this video, but it's something I was thinking a lot about in the last couple of months. And unfortunately in here, it really feels almost like two like one and a half to two books crammed into one big book because it goes from you know plot point to plot point to plot point to plot point to plot point and all of these very action-packed very driven without a lot of time to sort of digest what's happening there are a lot of really big consequences that are going to happen from the events in this book but unfortunately it doesn't give you enough time to really sit and rest and think about what's happening or the things that you know people have done and what could come of that and like but I feel like the first two books have that so have so much more of that and they are so better balanced and this one just it's just too much it's really too much now that being said I still love the characters that are introduced in here Melba is incredible Bull is amazing and the first time I read this I didn't really like Anna. I found her to be just, uh, just quite frankly, sanctimonious and really insufferable. There was still a touch of that for me when I was rereading this, but I actually really appreciated her character a lot more. And I thought she brought some balance to everything. I'm talking about balance again, God damn it. But it's, you know, it was, she brought a different perspective and she really was a character that was fully realized and really acted the way that I thought she, sh she would have and she should have. And even at times where she would be talking to someone and I wouldn't be agreeing with what she was saying, it made sense that she was saying it and I could really appreciate her contribution to the book so much more this time around. Okay, my next four star is Preludes and Nocturnes, uh, The Sandman Volume 1. I read this one yesterday. Um, I'm probably going to continue in this series. Um, I really enjoyed this. Um, oh, this is by Neil Gaiman, I should say that, um, as the, I believe he's the author. Yeah, he's the author, not the, um, not the artist in here. And this is a graphic novel. Um, I can't remember when this was originally published, um, but it's been a long time ago now. Um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, there was a little bit of a slow start to this for me, and I kind of had a hard time not really following the story, but really feeling like I was invested in it and I was interested in where it was going until maybe about halfway through. Um, but the artwork in here is really, really interesting, really creepy. I think um, Death and Dream both have beautiful, um, beautiful artwork surrounding them in this one. And by the time I got to the end, I really wanted to continue with this and I was very engaged and very interested in what was happening and what's going to continue happening. So there will be more of these in future wrap-ups. My next four star is Annihilation by Jeff Vandermeer. Another reread. I had uh, quite a few rereads this couple of months here. Um, I This is still a four star for me. I still really enjoy it. It's creepy. It's weird. It's strange. Um, I really think that Jeff Vandermeer is a really excellent author at just writing things that are very compelling but strange and one of the reasons why I always continue to read his books is I don't understand what's happening but I so want to and there's still a lot of that with this book and I still and I really enjoyed rereading it and my last four star book is Washington Black by Essie Adugin. Um, I listened to the audiobook for this one and holy shit it was incredible um, I highly recommend the audiobook for this one it was beautiful. The narrator did such a beautiful job of making all the characters unique, distinct, 
with their own voice, with their own personality. It was so well done. I think my favorite part in here was not think, I know. My favorite part in here was the ending. I thought it was such a beautiful discussion on closure and what it means and what it can mean and the ways in which we do and we don't receive it after long periods of trauma and harm. It was, it was really beautifully done. It was really beautifully done. I thought it was just an excellent piece of fiction. And I, this is one of the books in the stack that I'm just going to go ahead and say, I highly recommend this to basically anyone. If you're, if you've been interested in this before, um, pick it up, pick up the audio bit, book, pick up the physical book. It doesn't matter. This is beautiful. It made me fucking cry. Um, and I can't recommend this one enough. My next book is four and a half stars. And that is The Memory Police by Yoko Ogawa. Um, this one was another one that not another one. This one really kind of snuck up on me. I listened to the audiobook for all but the last hundred or so pages, and the last hundred pages were so good and just reading it physically. Um, and I really want to go back and reread the whole thing physically because I think if I if I do that, I think this is going to be definitely five stars. Um, this talks about, you know, these disappearances and these sort of mundane things leading into bigger things, going back to mundane things in such a way that's just so, that is just so full of acceptance for these really horrifying situations that just, as a reader, I felt like, I felt terrified for these characters, but they just, they accepted what was happening to them so readily. And it was very beautifully written. I thought that the portions of our main character's novel that was included in here was just a really good addition and a really good counter to the real the real scenarios that she was facing in her own life. Um, and I just, it is incredibly well written and I absolutely loved this book. This is another one I would recommend to basically anyone. Okay, and we are on to my four five star books of the past two months. And I am excited to talk about books that I'm very, that I was very happy to read. And the first one we have is Junji Ito's Cat Diary, Yan and Moo, the collector's edition. Um, this was just really cute. It was really fun. Um, it was, I love Junji Ito's artwork so much. I think he's such an incredible manga artist. And it was this kind of counterbalance between um, the happy cat life and these really just unsettling and uncanny pieces of art it was just so wonderfully done. I laughed quite a few times while reading this. Um, there's a beautiful tribute to Yawn at the end of this and I, I just, it was great. It was a really good time and it was a really good piece of just, you know, just, just brightness that I could include in a lot of the darker things I read this month. My next five star book is The Poppy War by R.F. Kuang. Uh, we read this for book club and it was an incredible book. I don't know that I have ever read anything as well written as this whenever it comes to being so fully immersed in a character's head that <laughs> there were so many times where Bren was making a decision that on reflection I was like that's a bad decision why are you doing that but I just it, when reading it I'm like yeah of course that's what you're gonna do I completely understand what you're doing let's fucking do it and then, it, and then it'd be like two pages later I'd be like why would you do that um this is beautifully written. It's the start of a series, which I'm really excited to continue with, and I really enjoyed it. This was a great book. And then my next five-star book was Elegy for the Undead by Matthew Vesely. This novella I picked up the audiobook for from, Le from Libby, um, and I was so engaged with this one. I was so interested in what was going on. I really had a hard time putting this down, and like trying, I would find myself doing things to be like, oh yeah, I really wanted to do this thing, but that would mean that I couldn't listen to the audiobook. So I'll put that off for a few minutes and then I'll do this other thing where I can listen to the audiobook. This was so beautifully sad and heartbreaking. This discusses the, um, the relationship of Jude and Lyle and, um, <laughs> it's set in, uh, not necessarily a zombie apocalypse, but a zombie outbreak. And it deals with, you know, loss and heartache and just a lot to do with the turbulence that you just face in romantic relationships. And it was just, it was really beautiful. Um, I found myself crying towards the end of it. 
and I, th I just it was so well written it was so engaging from start to finish I I really loved this one it was one of my favorites of maybe the whole year honestly it's yeah it's definitely up in my top five of the year so far um, I really, I really enjoyed it. I really loved it. I don't know how it, it's so short. I can't talk about too much of it without like major fucking spoilers. So I won't say any more about it except that, you know, it was, it was just really lovely. And I, I was so glad I read that this month. And then my last book, my favorite book that I read out of the last two months was Drawing of the Three by Stephen King. Um, I'm rereading the whole Dark Tower series, uh, this year. Primarily because we started the Gunslinger for Book Club and I can't, you know, read that without just wanting to read all the rest of them. Um, and I still love this one. I still think it's incredible. I still think it's one of the best in the entire series. Um, I love Eddie. I love Odetta slash Susanna. Um, I I think all of it's so good. It's there. I, I don't know what to say about this one that hasn't been said probably by everyone else in existence. Um, one thing I will say even though this is at the top of my stack, um, it is absolutely important to acknowledge that this was written in the 80s and there are a lot of parts of it that read like it. There are a lot of slurs that are just used with extreme casualness, um, you know, and the, uh, the optics again of a... The optics, once again, need to be discussed here of a white able-bodied male author writing a black disabled woman. Um, because it because those are a little those are a little rough and um but I I do still love Susanna as a character and I love Eddie and I love all of it and I love this book and it's still five stars for me and I still think it's great and yeah that's it I guess okay those were all the books that I read in March and April um I don't intend on doing a wrap up every other month again um March just ended up being a little weird but We'll see, this might become more of the norm depending on how some other stuff goes, but I hope you enjoyed. Uh, do algorithm things if you, if you fucking care. If not, don't, and uh, have a great day. Uh, don't watch this. Bye.